Welcome to the Practice You podcast. My name is Elena Brower. Let's dive into today's conversation regarding life's myriad transitions and how we refine our responses in our relationships, our wellness, our households, our work, and in our practices. You are invited to learn and love and listen with me. Welcome to Practice You. Welcome back to the podcast. I have an old friend with me today, somebody whom I have admired for many moons. Her name is Danny Shapiro. She is the author of 11 books. She's the host and creator of the hit podcast, Family Secrets. She's currently having her lawn mode, so you might hear the lawn guy. Her most recent novel, Signal Fires, is one of my favorite books of 2022 by far. I've read it twice already. It was also named a best book of 2022 by Time Magazine, Washington Post, Amazon, others. Is a national bestseller. Her most recent memoir, Inheritance, which I famously read in one flight, was an instant New York Times bestseller and named a best book of 2019 by L. Vanity Fair, Wired, and Real Simple. Both of these books were winners of the National Jewish Book Award, which I love. The little Jewish girl in me gets excited about that. Danny's work has been published in 14 languages. She's currently developing Signal Fires for its television adaptation. No way. (gasps) Oh my God, that's so good. Danny's book on the process and craft of writing, still writing, which I have the first edition here in my little hands here has just been reissued on the occasion of its 10th anniversary. Danny occasionally teaches workshops and retreats, so it's worth it to look at her website, dannyshapiro.com, which is D-A-N-I Shapiro. She's also the co-founder of the Siren Land Writers Conference in Positano, Italy, which I also plan to make at the soonest possible time. Danny, it's such a nice treat to have you here. I have lots of questions about Signal Fires. I am so touched by this book, and I thank you for your time today. Oh, it's so wonderful to be with you, Elena. I'm sitting here with this huge smile on my face just listening to your voice. Mm. Oh, bless. So as it happens, you know this, but maybe our listener doesn't know this. I have steeped myself in Soto Zen Buddhist studies for the last three years, going on four And of course, I subscribed to Lion's Roar magazine. And of course, it came very recently with uh, an article with you, a little interview with you. And I thought it was just so timely. The question from the interviewer was, your new book, Signal Fires, is not overtly Buddhist, and yet it seems to be infused with Buddhism. And your response I agree with that. It's been described as my most spiritual work, which is interesting because it's a novel and I've written nonfiction that is much more overtly spiritual. I want to get into that first and then the second question that the Lions Roar interviewer asked you. I am on page 102 of Signal Fires, and this is a chapter about Waldo. And as this book proceeds, our dear listener, you will find that we skip generations and we skip around in the chronological time spectrum in such a way that it is at first a little bit jarring and also very exciting. And the challenge for we, the reader, is to follow along, let go of all the needs for things to be in order chronologically and dip in, just dip in to what's happening. I love this so much because you talk, I'm going to read a few paragraphs if that's okay. Please. And yeah, you take us around in his life in such a cool way. He's crossing mountains, valleys, softer than moss. All words he doesn't yet know will be three years of no words before his parents send him to the cold office building where a lady will show him flashcards. Bug, dog, girl, bed, trying to get him to use his words. Use your words, Waldo. He will hear this many times and understand just what is being asked of him. But the words won't come. They would be locked in a place within him. His mother will worry. Her creased forehead, her puzzled eyes will imprint themselves on him, something he will carry all his life. Whenever he disappoints a woman he loves, it will be this look on his mother's face that he sees without knowing it. 
He will be a grown man someday, an esteemed professor of astrophysics, who is unable to use his words. Talk to me, Waldo, his wife will say a thousand times. Talk to me. So this is but one, our listener, of so many examples of some of Danny's writing that just moves me to tears. And I never know exactly what's moving me to tears, but I just know this. If you're a writer and you're listening to us right now, let go of everything you need chronologically and just start to put down facts and descriptions and notes on pages because I feel like I'm in your head, Danny, finding your way through this character and learning about him across a timeline that has no chronological respect whatsoever. And yet I'm learning more about him in two paragraphs than I could possibly learn if you had given me the whole chronology of his life. Mm -hmm. I love that. You know what I mean? I do. I do. I mean, one of the things I thought a lot about, um, I think a lot about generally, but I was thinking a lot about while I was writing Signal Fires, is that we live life forward, inexorably forward. I mean, time actually does move chronologically forward, but our experience of time and of memory and of our lives and of our inner lives are nothing if not like achronological. They are kaleidoscopic. And I really wanted to try to capture that in this novel and in the way that this constellation of characters, as I think of them, Waldo being my favorite. So I'm so glad that you read a bit in Waldo's world. But, you know, we're able to experience him as a newborn and as an 11 year old boy who's very lonely. And, you know, life is not easy for him when he's 11. But then we get to feel the great satisfaction of knowing that he's going to, in the fullness of time, become this extraordinary person with a fulfilled life. And then it allows us to tolerate the things that are hard about his present when he's a young boy. And certain poems of mine, in a late editing, it inspired me to change a few things around and stop thinking my reader needed to have things in order Mm -hmm. and really kind of go off what I thought I had to do in a way that made things very, very moving and touching for me you know, as I was writing them. I love hearing that because I think what that really does when writers are able to do that, whether it's in poems or in novels or memoirs or essays, is it allows the reader in by respecting the reader and trusting the reader. Trusting. Yeah. In trusting the reader, there is this way in which the reader is participating is stretching along with you in a way the writer is reaching out a hand and the reader is touching that hand, grasping that hand. And it is a kind of dance. And I think when writers, myself included in my earlier work, and you know, it's something that I, I just think about a lot, when we feel like we need to guide the reader, that can veer into controlling the reader And not allowing for that very satisfying feeling of being inside a piece of work. Yes, and inside a family. Mm -hmm. Page 103, there's a later paragraph in this description of Waldo. At the foot of his bassinet, a handwritten sign, Shankman. This is he, Waldo Shankman, the latest in a long line of Shankman's heir to all of it. The rage, the fear, the kind-heartedness, the confusion, the loneliness, the instinct for survival that stretches back from the hospital in Avalon to a house in New Jersey to a shtetl in a country that no longer exists. This, too, he will carry. I mean, wow. You know, can a little chain of letters on a page become words and walk a whole body into another time. Yes. <laughs> like, wow. Oh, uh, thank you. I mean, that was everything that I was aiming for, hoping for in creating these characters and this world. Um, and in order to do that, one has to leap. And one can only leap really not knowing if there is ground 
if it's going to work or not. Um, and so all of those feelings, like the passages that you read are in a moment in the novel where Waldo is being born, right? So Waldo himself is certainly not, he, he certainly doesn't have that language. You know, the, the narrator or the, or me, the author is supplying him with that language, is offering the language and the scope of his whole life that already exists. It's funny, I was thinking just today, Elena, I was thinking about my son, who's now 24. I was thinking about the moment when I was breastfeeding him when he was about, I want to say, five or six weeks old, whatever the age is where an infant really smiles for the first time. And it was the middle of the night. It was, you know, three in the morning and I was there and I can bring back the chair that I was sitting in and the TV that was on silent and, you know, in the background and the flickering lights. And uh, we were on 92nd and Broadway on the 12th floor. I remember the whole thing. And I looked down at him and I really thought I was hallucinating because looking up at me and connecting like so intensely with this huge grin on his face was my infant. And the feeling I had was, I know you and you know me and we have always known each other and we will always know each other. And that feeling of like, I know you, I know the person that you're going to be someday is already within you. And that was something I so wanted to try to capture in fiction. Mm. Ooh, I have tears in my eyes. <laughs> I'm remembering the, the glider on Greenwich and Dwayne. <laughs> This leads perfectly into that second question from the Lions Roar interview. What are some spiritual concepts you've grappled with in Signal Fires? And you answer like this. I was thinking a great deal about time and death and energy. The structure of the novel is not chronological. It moves around in time. It was the only way I could tell a story about the feeling I have that whoever we've been and will ever be is always alive within us. I find that to be a very comforting idea, and I gave some of that thinking to several of my characters. So, to your point exactly, I was just interviewed for a Maiden Mother Crone series of talks, and the, one of the first questions was, what do you think of when you hear this? And it's funny, it was subconscious. I had already read this piece but I said something like, oh, I don't even think about these words because I think all of these energies are within us all the time from, you know, I know little girls who are six and eight years old who are Crohn's. Uh -huh. Similarly, I know people who are in their 70s and 80s who are still teenagers, uh -huh. <laughs> like maidens. Uh -huh. um, yeah, I, was, I just want to echo that point that if you're listening to us and this is resonating for you, just know like time is kind of an illusion and you're still the person that you're picturing and you're also on your deathbed right now. How are you going to show up? You know, oh my God, it's just such a huge concept. It is. And it's paradoxical because it can seem on the surface of it terrifying, but it in fact, when you scratch the surface and get beneath it and are inside of it, it's enormously comforting. You know, and Signal Fires is a book that some hard things happen, you know, to some of the characters within its pages because it covers a swath of 50 years. And if you cover a swath of 50 years in a variety of people's lives, some hard things are going to happen. And yet, you know, what I keep on hearing from readers that makes me so happy is that it offers a kind of hope or um, solace for this question of how do we live if from the moment we are born, the only way out of this existence is death. I mean, that's just every single living thing on the planet is living in that cycle. And so how do we do life? You know, it's funny, as I'm talking to you, I keep on my desk the cover. It's actually the French edition of my memoir, Inheritance. It's called Heritage. And the reason why I keep it on my desk, propped up and looking at me, is because the cover is an image of me as a three-year-old. 
which it wasn't in the States, by the way. In the English version, it was just a little dress hanging on the That's fire. right. That's right. In several foreign editions, in Russia and in France, they've used this image that was actually a professional photograph taken of me as a very small child. And I keep her near me because there's just something on little Danny's face in this image that I want to remind myself of and to understand that that child is still very much alive and, you know, inside of me, present. Mm. Yes. I love that picture. It's funny because we have a, a dear and deepening friendship, but we don't really get to spend a whole lot of time together. And it just so happens that I also have a picture of myself as a six-year-old on my desk to remind me of who I am. <laughs> mm. Isn't that funny? Mm. It's so strange mm. and wonderful. Wow. It is. And we sh- share that curiosity and desire, I would say, um, that I feel to sort of hold all of the all of the selves, even the ones in, in this particular case, that's a pretty comfortable one for me. But, you know, I have an image of myself from my very brief modeling career in the 1980s. And it's hanging in our basement. It, my husband calls it my star 80 picture. And, you know, I don't have a particularly comfortable relationship with that photograph. I mean, my eyes are sort of vacant. I'm lost. I'm a mess. I'm, you know, really like sort of at a low point in my life. But that too, her too, she's alive inside of me too. At least for me, I feel like all of those, you know, Russian nesting dolls or in my memoir, Hourglass, I use a, a, a metaphor of those paper dolls that, you know, some of us made as, you know, that you, you cut out and then you open them and they're all connected. They're basically all holding hands and they stretch out all of them over the course of as wide as your arms can go. There are that many. It's so touching to me to hear you talk about these. It's as though we're marching through dimensions when we're talking and I can see all the way into the past and all the way into the future it makes me think about, I wasn't planning on talking about this with you today because I was going to save still writing for the Circle of Wonder when we talked toward the end of the month. It reminds me of the time that you had to put on that Agnes suit for the research at MIT. Oh my gosh. So uh-huh. for, for our listener, you need to get uh-huh. still writing. If you're even remotely interested in writing, you need to get Danny's book still writing. But there's a part of it where she talks about going into this sort of study in, at MIT, and they put on a suit that helps you feel like you're much older than you are. Weights in certain places, spikes on the soles of the feet, like things that would sort of point to somebody who's 80 or 90 years old, the pains they would have, the heaviness, the gravity they would feel. Can you talk a little bit about that experience? Because you don't talk deeply about it in still writing, but it really dawns on me. Yeah, that was such an unexpected gift, um, having that experience. And it was a real moment of, of education for me as well, because my husband and I were both at this place where they were doing these studies. And we were there because we had been hired as writers to write a play for a pharmaceutical company. It was really actually quite a low point where I thought like, oh my God, my life as a writer has come to this. I'm working for big pharma and I'm writing this play to increase people's empathy for those who are suffering from Alzheimer's because it was an Alzheimer's drug trial that they were. And yet, because we were there, one of the things that was happening there was this Agnes suit that had been designed specifically so that wearers would be able to increase the depths of their empathy toward people who were elderly and suffering with dementia. And I just randomly was chosen to put this suit on. It it looked like an astronaut suit. It had um, bungee cords limiting uh, your range of motion in your arms and legs. It had scratched goggles 
that were sort of yellow tinted goggles, really, really affecting your ability to see headphones that were creating just a ruckus of noise with sounds coming in and out that were sort of indistinguishable from one from the next and Crocs that were, had been outfitted with spikes in the soles so that um, to mimic the feeling of neuropathy. And in this suit, I had to like climb a flight of stairs and go to a buffet and pick up a plate and, you know, put some salad on the plate and find a seat and sit down. And it was an absolutely illuminating moment that also showed me how I might be as someone in that, um, you know, in that state, which basically was, I just wanted to sit down and wait it out. <laughs> you know, there were other people who were, you know, fighters um, or, you know, were sort of raging against it or looking for workarounds. That person, that window into that person of just extraordinarily restricted capacities was something that I didn't have in my playbook. You know, I didn't have that as something that I had experienced. And it was all because we were doing this job that we didn't even want to be doing, which to me, you know, it was one of those lessons in just showing up and actually really having no idea what the larger plan is. Then coming to find out that it was actually a really wonderful window wonderful. And as I was experiencing it, I didn't know that I would ever write about it. I sort of tucked it away. And it actually was my memoir, Hourglass. Um, I think I wrote about it and still writing, but I, I know I wrote about it in Hourglass because Hourglass is about marriage and time and memory. And we were both having these experiences of, you know, these empathy tests related to aging and dementia. And we each handled them very, very differently, which was just absolutely fascinating to me. I got a little peek, you know, like you're talking about the little peek in signal fires. I got a little window into who my husband might be as someone, you know, who was. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting when you said, I just wanted to sit down and wait it out for a moment. It speaks to your practice, I think. <laughs> yeah. For real, like you have a very regular, supportive practice in your life for a number of decades. And to not resist, but in fact to accept and then, you know, move as sort of elegantly as you can through it and wait and listen uh -huh. is probably a pretty good recipe, uh -huh. I would say. And perhaps that's what all of practice is for in a way. Yeah. Unquestionably, that is what it is for, for that end of life. I just had the privilege of one of my dearest friends, Jody, whose father was the person who advised us to leave New York for COVID, if we could, just passed. And before he passed, he his already liver was failing. He was already sort of a different color and he was fully cognizant. And he was fully cognizant that he would be dead in the next 48 hours. And he recorded a video for his grandchildren, twins, Raven and Rowan. It was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Mm. They're like four. He was letting them know that every single time they look up at the sky, they need to ask their mother where he is. And she will point to the cloud. That is him. Mm. He will take care of them. He will watch over them. He will protect them. Like he was this kind of a dude. It was the most touching thing I've ever seen. And it made me think like, okay, this is something that I feel like all of us should do. Record the message to the folks that we love the most, maybe even once a year, just in case. It was so moving. And it was so like he was too far down on the screen he was like lying down. So it was really an awkward angle. You know what I mean? All the things that you wouldn't do. This conversation made me think about that. And I wanted to share that with you. It was really stunning. Oh, that's, that's beautiful. And, yeah. and, you know, I think in a way what we're really talking about 
And the thing that was, you know, so front of mind for me as I was working on signal fires was interconnectedness. And, you know, you brought up the COVID times and, you know, so many of our lives were so deeply impacted in so many ways by the last few years. I wrote a big chunk of signal fires during COVID and I was really thinking about the ways in which we are all so powerfully interconnected. And I think about my dad, who I was very close to, uh, who died when I was a very young woman. And I absolutely feel him with me every day. Like you just described, those twins are going to grow up feeling their grandfather with them, even if they don't have very strong memories of him because of the, the gift that he left them with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have to hold myself back from talking about still writing until our next conversation, but I just want to really reiterate to our listener, I have to stay away from reading any more of Signal Fires to you because I will ruin the surprises that are coming to you. Signal Fires is one of the most uplifting, twisting, gorgeous, stunning, help you think about the details of your life and your choices uh, book I've ever uh, read. And I want to really encourage you if you're listening to get Signal Fires and read it and bring it on a trip or, you know, plan a weekend where you're just not going to put the book down unless you're eating or showering because it's fast and it's going to sweep you up under its skirt and take you in and help you to see the world completely differently. Well, that's, oh. that's beautiful, Elena. Thank you. It's true. It's totally true. I, I was weeping so many times. What I will say, the very last, um, page 217, there's one line that I pulled out. The whole crowd is here, invisible, surrounding them. The air shimmers with everyone he has ever loved. That just, like... I'm not spoiling the book. I'm not doing anything, but I am saying like, wow, should we all feel this at the end of our lives? Should we all feel this when things are difficult? May our listener, may you feel this when things are difficult, that the air is shimmering around you with everyone you've ever loved all the time. The whole book just made me think about things totally differently, Danny. I'll never stop thanking you for this. Mm. That means so much to me. Yeah. I'm really glad. And I'm claiming you also for the end of the month for Circle of Wonder. And I just want to say the last bit that you gave to the interviewer in the Lions Roar magazine for our listener. You wrote and read or said, and this is also in reference to signal fires. I was thinking a great deal about place. If something tragic has happened in a particular spot, does that somehow still exist in that spot decades later, centuries later? We walk on streets and paths and in places where profound things have happened. Do we absorb that? I feel like we do. I wanted to find a way to capture that in a work of literature. So you have. Um, <laughs> obviously, you have. Um, I will not say any more about it because I don't want to ruin it for our listener. But I will say this. If you're listening to us and there's a certain place where something happened that was really hard or something happened that was really wonderful... The place, I think, and as Danny can attest, still holds the energy of that event. And I think it's nice to just have a little bit of healthy respect for that and act accordingly. I wonder what you think about that, Danny. I'm sitting here nodding. I feel that so strongly. And more and more, I feel that. And, you know, I'll tell you just a, a brief story, um, which when I was working on Signal Fires, I didn't have a title. I really, I didn't have a title until I finished it. And the file name in my computer for the novel was Magic Novel, because that's what it felt like to me. And I had started the book more than a dozen years ago, and I had created all of the characters. I had written about 100 pages that remain pretty much intact in the book as it is in the world. I needed to stop. I wasn't ready to finish it. I had lost my way and I put it in a drawer. And so there's one character in Signal Fires named um, Dr. Benjamin Wilf. And I had fully created him along with Waldo, along with all of the other characters in the novel. 
And then about six years later, I made the discovery that I write about in my memoir, Inheritance. I made the discovery that my dad, my beloved dad who raised me, was not my biological father and that there was this completely other human being out there in the world who I hadn't known existed, who I literally come from biologically, and I was able to meet him. And it's a long story, which I won't get into in this conversation, but I'm mentioning it because I had already created the character of Ben Wilf. Oh, my God. And Oh, my God. Yeah. And, <gasps> and when I returned to the novel, the magic novel, and I then finished it, there is this character who, like my biological father, is a doctor, is, in fact, a pulmonologist, who is a lover of poetry, who is a very fine human being, who sort of is gentle, but also has a very strong, like, spine to him. I never once thought about it as I was working on the book. And when I finished the novel, like, I gave the manuscript to my son, who is always, these days, one of my first readers. And I'll never forget this moment. He came into my office and he was holding the manuscript and he said, Mom, he's just like him. So explain that to me, oh, Elena. God, oh my God. I'm just now recalling, you know how when you read a book, the place where you read the book becomes part of the book? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm in the hotel room in Denver where I read the book in the tub, basically finished most of the book in a four-hour tub that I had to re reheat many times. I've, I've mentioned this to you before, the book Inheritance, where we meet your biological father for the first time. And it didn't even dawn on me, but of course, Ben Wilf in Signal Fires even is descriptively looking like mm -hmm. him. Mm -hmm. And anyone who doesn't know what I'm sharing now, who had read Inheritance would think, oh, well, Danny must have based this character on her biological father. That would make sense. But I didn't. But I did, right? There's a line that repeats itself several times toward the opening of Signal Fires, which is everything that has ever happened is still happening. And there was this very strong feeling that I had that, I mean, these characters, you know, when you write a novel, the characters become themselves in this utterly mysterious way. The novelist is not there sort of pulling the marionette strings and making the characters, you know, this way or that way or do this or do that. Really, the novelist is like creates the characters and then follows them. And so this character of Ben Wilf, he already existed uh, within me the way that all of the characters did. But he really did already exist in the world as the human being without whom I would not exist. And it's like, if I had written Signal Fires after that discovery and that encounter and getting to know my biological father, if it had been afterwards, I probably would have been able, psychologically and creatively speaking, to trace it back and go, oh yeah, that's probably where the origin was. But the origin is something infinitely more mysterious than that. And not, it's in your DNA. Yes, like you wrote that from your DNA. Yes. It makes me want to say, and I like try and speak to my listener, our listener, as often as I can, because I want to involve them in the process of this practice of podcasting that we have. And we didn't even get to talk about family secrets, but we will. If you are a writer or trying to write, you know, it may just be that whatever you need to write about is literally lodged in your cells. And if you listen long enough and do what Danny suggests and still writing, which is make sure you're showing up for the muse and sitting down and spending the time, you will hear what needs to come through you, just as Danny has. Mm. And just as you have. Oh, trying. <laughs> oh, my God, I'm trying my best. Two last things. I want to talk about family secrets briefly. Please tell me exactly where this podcast came from and where our listener can go and listen to it. Mm, thanks. Yes. Um, 
family secrets came about in a completely organic way. I was working on inheritance, which was about the discovery that in fact, I was the family secret, that my very origins were kept secret from me. And people started, well, people actually always had tended to share pretty intimate stories from their lives with me. And, but they began to more so. And I found myself one day, I was actually on the phone with my dear friend, the Buddhist mindfulness teacher, Sylvia Borstein. And Sylvia was telling me a story of a family secret of hers. And I had the thought, I wish I could share this. It's such a beautiful story and she's such an amazing storyteller. And then the next thought that went through my mind was podcast. I wonder if there's a podcast where the host or the creator of the podcast really does a kind of impeccable deep dive with a guest into the evolution of discovering a family secret or the evolution of holding a family secret or the evolution of realizing that you've kept a secret somehow from yourself. So I, I started the podcast and as it turns out, this is now three and a half years ago. And um, it turns out that it really, really resonated because I think most families do have secrets, do carry secrets. And sometimes that's, you know, kept in the name of love or protection or fear or shame. But when they come out, they all really tend to share something when they kind of see the light of day and when they're aired out. And so the podcast is now in its eighth season. Wow. Um, and, you know, has a really, really wonderful community of listeners. So eight seasons means each season is 10 episodes. That means that I've sat down and done these really deep dives with 80 souls at this point. And it's been such an honor and a privilege and a kind of amazing thing for me as someone who spends most of my time very much in my own inner life and alone in a room, being able to really connect voice to voice. I mean, to me, you know, right now we're having a conversation. We're not looking at each other. Our listeners will be listening to this conversation in their ears, you know, in their car or when they're folding laundry or when they're out for a hike or, um, you know, it's a, a very intimate experience. And I love that so much about it. And so, yeah, it's just been one of the gifts in my life. And in terms of, I mean, you can, wherever you get your podcasts, as they say, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. just Family Secrets is available. Wonderful. Wonderful. I'm so grateful for all the work that you've done. And the last gratitude I would like to deliver once again, and I'll repeat this many times over, but you're pointing me in the direction of Anne Truitt, artist and writer, mm. was also a big game changer. I ended up including one of her quotes in my book of poetry as one of the very few other people's quotes that I included. And also you're actually, you have a poem in there, but we'll talk about it in the next time we talk. I forgot to bring the book with me here. I look forward to um, that. And, I can't wait. And also if we're just going to sort of circle back to the theme of everything being connected, um, I think what happened, correct me if I'm wrong, but I posted something on my Instagram, um, as I often do, of Anne Truitt's because she is a very important part of my creative life. And I love sharing her art and I love sharing her words. And then you wrote to me and you said that you had made a painting that was eerily similar. Yes, to right. Um, this image of a sculpture of Anne Truitt's that you had never seen. And that painting, I'm looking at it right now. Is oh. I framed it and it's so beautiful and it's hanging on the wall in my office, partly because it's beautiful and it's yours. And also because it's the, this reminder of the way that art exists in the world. If only, as you were just saying to uh, your listeners, if only we get quiet enough to really see what is there shimmering. Yes. Oh, God, I forgot all about that. What a wonderful reminder. And she has changed my life. And the quote that I put in was something about coming into the inheritance of her own life, a realm over which time has no sway. Mm. 
And I wondered, as my last question, if you had any sort of cognitive clocking of that quote when you wrote Inheritance. That's interesting. Uh, Not cognitive. Yeah. um, But I certainly, as you speak it, it was important to me too. I remember it and and true, it is very much, um, a, you know, a guide for me in my life as a woman, uh, an artist, uh, a mother, a person in the world, um, getting older, navigating all of life's passages with an open heart and a kind of discerning intellect. And I don't know if I ever told you this, but I crossed paths with her. <gasps> no. Um, I was at Yaddo, which is this great artist colony in Saratoga Springs, New York. And Anne Truitt was at Yaddo at the same time. It was an August. I was a young writer. She was an older writer. She was formidable. And I was shy and probably suffering from a certain amount of imposter syndrome around all these great composers and artists and writers and poets who had graced the, you know, halls of Yaddo over the many decades. And I was too shy to ever speak to her. And I knew nothing of her work. It was my first encounter with her. But um, boy, was I, that was also a lesson for me. Because, you know, in retrospect, what would that have been? Or was I apparently really meant to know her on the page and in her work. And she has a very beautiful account on Instagram. Her Um, daughter keeps it up. Her daughter keeps it. And I've gotten to know her daughter a bit. And, you know, what an honor that is. I remember one day Anne Truitt following me on Instagram. And I was like, wait a minute, Anne Truitt has been not walking this earth for a while now. And it's her daughter, Alexandra, doing this beautiful homage to her mother and her mother's legacy. Indeed. I can't tell you how much her work has touched me. Really. There was Prospect, Daybook, Prospect, and then posthumously, Alexandra made Yield from her last journals. That's right. And Turn also. Turn, right. Yeah. And if I'm not mistaken, here's the weirdest part of all. I actually think that that line about inheritance, and I come into the inheritance of my own life, a realm over which time has no sway. I'm pretty sure it was in Yield, which is the book that was made posthumously, which would have been after your inheritance came out, (laughs) I think. Oh, my God. It's one of the greatest treats of my life to know you. Your poem is one of the last ones in the book. It is a real privilege to call you a friend and an influence on my work. And I really thank you for giving us, my listener and me, all of this wonderful time with you today, Danny. Thank you so much. Elena, thank you. You are a gift in my life, and Mm. I am so grateful to you and Mm. all that you teach me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.